Now, many Jewish believers, here's how this has come about. Many Jewish believers had stopped, had stepped out of Judaism into Christianity. Now, for them to have been for birth, for 1,500 years, all they knew was born offering, sacrifice, the religion, the duties that they learned from the tabernacle, and that was all they knew. Now, Jesus come with a new way, and they call it Christianity. And a lot of the folks didn't understand that, and some that became Christian wanted to revert back to the old order. But they couldn't find anything that substantiated them returning back because Paul was one of the pioneers of Christianity, teaching Christianity. So the book of Hebrews, if you're going to title it, title it A Better Covenant. A better covenant. Christ is better than the angels, for they worship him. He's better than Moses, for he created him. He's better than the Aaronic priesthood, for his sacrifice was once and for all. He's better than the law, for he mediated a better covenant. In short, there's more to be gained in Christ than the loss to be lost in Judaism. Pressing on in on Christ produced test, faith, self-discipline, and a visible loving and a very good work. So as we explore the book of Hebrews, we are in for a fantastic ride. Put your hat on, hold it down, don't let anybody disturb you, because this is one of the most fascinating books in the New Testament. And when you look at it and they ask you who wrote it, they give you four authors, contributors, Paul, Luke, Priscilla, and Timothy. Timothy is one mentioned by name in the book. Now, it says, God at sundry time and in divers manners spake in time past unto the Father by the prophets. Now, when you look at this, the title of the first four verses, three verses, is the sovereignty or the superiority of Christ over the prophets. Because what it says here is that long ago God spoke in many different ways to our father through the prophets. He spoke to them in visions, dreams, and even face to face, telling them little by little about his plan. He showed, uh, he showed Isaiah that Jesus was coming. He showed Moses Jesus was coming. So he spoke to them in visions. He spoke to them through words. He spoke to them through signs. And verse 2 says, Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Then said world, but worlds. But now in the day he hath spoken to us through his son, to whom he hath given everything, and through whom he made the world and everything there is. So God told Isaiah that unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. He used the word in the same scripture that Emmanuel, Emmanuel mean God in the flesh. And so we had all of the signs and the prophets had all of the signs. 
And when Jesus showed up, they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. God's son shine out with God's glory. Jesus came in God's glory. Notice he shined out in it, for when he was born, there was a light shining in Bethlehem. They saw the light. So God shined out with God's glory. The sun shined out with God's glory. And all that God's son is and does make him as God. So there's nothing about Jesus that God himself could do that Jesus could not do. He was as much God as God is and as much man as man is. Yet he never confused one with the other. He never forgot about being a man and he never forgot about being God. The two never clashed. They always worked in their perspective places. As a man, he became hungry. As God, he never was. As a man, he bought the things that he needed. As God, everything was his. The cattle on a thousand hill belonged to him. As man, he cried out, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? But as God, he said, I'll never leave you. Hallelujah. These are things that you can't understand. Because that's why they had the big fight about how can a man be God. And that took some time for them to understand that. And still today, many still don't understand it. He regulated the universe by the mighty power of his command. He is the one who died to cleanse us and clear our record of all sins. And then sat down in the highest honor beside the great God of heaven. Now Hebrews, we're going to get to it. But in Hebrews, here's a magnificent thing. Here's something that the New Testament and Old Testament and the transliteration that happened that we even don't realize it happened. And we, we don't understand that the Levites, all of the priests in the Old Testament came through the tribe of the Levites. That was the priestlyhood. The book of Levi uh, writes about, Leviticus writes about the Levites. It writes about the priesthood that was taken from Aaron. But now, Jesus did not come through the, the tribe of the Levites. Jesus came through the tribe of Judah. So then coming through the tribe of Judah, how could he be a priest when all the Bible said that every priest it was came through the tribe of the Levites? But then he, he made himself a priest back in the, uh, the, the 14th chapter of Genesis when he met Abraham and Abraham after battle and he met him in the name of Melchizedek. And the Bible said he was a high priest. And then you get it transliterated into Hebrews. And when it brought over to Hebrews, then the writer of Hebrews brought it over and told you, said, not only was he the high priest, but he was a king. And not only was he the king, but he was the high priest. And a high priest means that he was the highest of all. He was the high priest, then the high priest that they made on earth because his priesthood was not only on earth, but it was in heaven. And then he only sacrificed one time, but the high priest had to have sacrifice every year. And so he was a priest not after the manner. See, Jesus was not a priest after the manner of the Leviticus because then he'd have been a priest after man. But he was a priest after the manner of El Melchizedek. And Melchizedek was not a priest after the manner of man, but he was a priest of God. Matter of fact, Melchizedek never had a beginning and never had an end. And he was never born. Y'all, I'm, I'm losing you. So Melchizedek then was Jesus in the flesh in the Old Testament. And Abraham paid tithes to him and had communion with him. Well, Lord, I lost him, but I'm going to try to bring him up. Then we get to verse 4. We just looked at the superiority of Christ over the prophets. Then we get to verse 4, and Christ is superior because of his deity. Being made so much better than the angels, 
as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Jesus have a better name than the angels because there was angels that fallen. Amen. Jesus never fell. Amen. Thus he became far better and far greater than the angels as proven by the fact that his name, Son of God, which was passed on to him from his father is far greater than the name and title of an angel. Angels cannot be saved. If an angel sin, they lose their estate or they lose their status with God and they put into a hole in place where they can never serve anymore. So angels was created. Jesus was God. And God held a name for many years in heaven. And he wouldn't name anybody until Jesus proved himself. And when Jesus proved himself, that name that no is above every name. And they were looking for the name. They were waiting for the name. And they put in a strive names to God. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Salaam. All of these names they ascribed to God, but that was not Jesus. When God got ready to bring Jesus through the flesh, he named him himself. He said, thou shalt bring forth a child, and his name shall be called Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. And the name Jesus is the transliteration of the name Joshua. Joshua in the Old Testament's deliverance, salvation. Moses brought the peoples almost to the promised land. Joshua brought them there, and Joshua delivered them in the property into the hands of the tribe. Salvation delivered us out of the hands of the devil into the kingdom of God. His name shall be called Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sin. Thus he became far greater than the angels, as proven by the fact that his name, Son of God, which was passed on to him from his father is far greater than the name and title of the angel. Verse 5, for under which of the angels and which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. For God never said to any angel, you may be my son. And today I've given you honor and that goes with that name. But God said it about Jesus. Another time he said, I'm his father and he's my son. And still, after all of that, and still another time, he said, when his firstborn son came to earth, God said, let all the angels worship him. All the angels worship him. So, son is superior. Now, I want to interject this because many of you have been told, if you haven't, you meet a group of folks, and I'm not fighting that group of people. I'm just going to say their doctrine is, if you have not been baptized in Jesus' name, you're not saved. Regardless of what you do, you're not saved. Okay. If they would understand the Bible, and allow, not allow, a dictation, a wrong exegesis of scripture, confuse them. Like the folks are confused coming from the old to the new. They wouldn't say that. Because Jesus said himself, if you have seen me, when Philip said, show us the Father, and it will suffice us, it will satisfy us. He said, how long have I been so long with you and yet you don't know me? I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. And the works that I do, I don't do them on myself, but the Father in me, he does the work. He said the Father and I are one. Lord, make them one as we are one. So I cannot be baptized in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost and leave Jesus out because Jesus is the Son. Now, my Son is my Son. Now, if I call him Garen, if I call him Patrick, if I call him Frederick, they are all my son. Now, 
if somebody say those are hardened bars, those are hardened bars, they are. They just got a prefix of another name. But their given names are hardened. They was hardened before he was a Garen. Because hardened is who I am. Jesus was God before he gave him the name. Because God is who he is. Oh, y'all ain't gonna, gonna like me on this. So if they understand who God is, they understand then that his son is him. And so if they say father, baptizing you in the name of father, father is a title. Son is a title. Holy Ghost is a title. But we all use titles. And if I use a title, the person, the pronoun, if I say that's my son, that means that that title is that I begotten him. He's a hardened. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. And nobody in here, if I said that's my only son, nobody's going to say he's not a hardened. And if anybody said they baptized him in the name of hardened, they know then that that, that, that that was a part of my son. And they're going to say, well, wait a minute, he can't be baptized in the name of hardened because he's not a hardened. That was a title. That's his daddy. And his daddy is not him. Well, I am him because if it had not been for me, it wouldn't be no him. My people perish for lack of knowledge. And so we have to understand. That's why I'm not a fighter. I simply want to exegete scriptures. I simply want to bring them out. And I don't want to use a scripture and take it out of his sitting to make it fit me. Because that's called wretching the scripture. That means I'm twisting it to make it fit me. Verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He never said that to an angel. Never, never. Verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he said, and let all the angels of God worship him. Now, Jesus was not born. He was begotten. Begotten. Be is the fulfillment of being. Oh, Jesus, help me here. Somebody had to be before you can be gotten. So God was be, and he begotten himself out of himself. Okay, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm losing somebody. Wait a minute. Is B the beginning? You can't have a beginning without B. You can't be in without something being. And so God was the beginning. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. Now, when I use the word with, it means that something pertain or something belong. So if in the beginning it was a word and another something was with the word and whatever was with the word became the same as the word and the only way it could become the same, it had to be the same from the beginning. And the only way to distinguish so we could understand it, they had to put some dis distribution of name, attributes of names on it. So he said, I'm going to call myself father. I'm going to call my son, son, Jesus. And I'm going to call the other part of me the Holy Ghost. So the folks think there are three and there's only one. And so no mathematician has ever been able to figure out how can you have three in one. They made a machine or called three in one, but they were talking about three purpose. Put the oil on and it'll stop the squeak. Put the oil on and make the machine run better. Put the oil on and it'll help the machine last longer. Well, if you get the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will preserve you. You can't get the Holy Ghost without getting Jesus. And you can't get Jesus if there's no God. And so when you see Jesus, you see God. He is as much God as God is. And the only thing, the reason God made himself Jesus so that he can look on you. You can't look on God face and live, but you can look in the face of Jesus and see God. Lord Jesus, help me here. Why well, I love Hebrew. You want to know my favorite books is Psalms and Hebrew. Man, I can walk the floor and teach Hebrew because I love Hebrew. 
My God, I love Hebrew because Hebrew brings everything from the Old Testament into the New Testament and it shows you how he did it. And my God, this is how he did it. He said he's better than the angels. He said, and then he said in verse 8, verse 7, he said, and, and, and other angels, he said, who maketh his angel spirit and he, his minister a flame of fire. And a lot of folks took that and said, God make us set us on fire. He was talking about the angel. And, and do you remember when, when, when let me calm down a little. Do you remember when Elijah looked out and, 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 and the young man looked out and he said, oh my God, he saw all the Syrian around the camp. They had them all surrounded and he said, we're going to die. He said, Lord, open up his eyes. And he opened his eyes and he saw all the chariots of fire. God let the angels be fire. And he said, it's more with me. He said, I love Father. It's more with us than it is with them. And I want you to understand something, that God, every time, every man and woman that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you're full of the Holy Ghost, do you understand you are never alone? And don't ever try to act like and succumb to the devil like you are out there fighting by yourself. God said, if I'm for you, I'm more than the whole world against you. And you got to understand that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. The angels have to obey God. Now, don't ever pray to an angel. Don't say, God, I'm praying. I want Gabriel to. No, don't ask him for it. All the angels do is look into the face of God. And when you need some help, and if you need an angel, the angels is already there. Because they're looking into the face of God. And when they look into the face of God, if God said, go down and help him, the angel is already there. And the only difference in an angel and us, an angel can appear and disappear. And we cannot disappear. But one of the things is, is the angels don't like us because the angel cannot cry I've been redeemed because our angel cannot sing the song I've been redeemed our angel cannot be redeemed but I am redeemed I am redeemed I said I'm redeemed I said I'm redeemed I'm redeemed I'm redeemed I'm redeemed hallelujah glory to God glory to God glory to God oh my God now, 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 watch how, how the writer put this. He says that God speaks of his angels as messengers, swift as the wind, and as servant made of flame and fire. But his son, he said, your kingdom, O God, will last forever and ever. His command are, are always just and right. Always just and right. Always just and right. Verse number nine. He said, well, let me go back to verse 8. But unto the Son, he said, thou throne, O God, is forever and ever. A sceptic of righteousness is the sceptic of the kingdom. Now, notice what he said. He said, of what? A sceptic of righteousness. That means what? The lawgiver. That's what the word sceptic means, lawgiver. When in the Old Testament, the king had a rod. The king was the lawgiver. If he raised the rod, you could approach him. If he didn't raise it, you couldn't come. If he pointed the rod at a law, that's what happened. You die or you live. So he said, the sceptic is the lawgiver. And so the angels were not the lawgivers. My God, look at this. Look what he said now. Thou have loved, loved what? Thou have loved righteousness and hated what? Iniquity. Therefore, what? Well, let me go back to verse 8. Uh, but unto the son, he said, thou throne, O God, is forever and what? A scepter. You are the lawgiver of what? Righteousness is the what? Scepter of thy kingdom. You rule your kingdom with righteousness. Verse 9. Thou lovest righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, God, even thou, God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thou fellows. They are above angels. Jesus having an anointed. Matter of fact, his anointing is so great they called him the anointed one. Yeah. Yeah. The anointed one. Yeah. You know what the word anointed mean? Write it down. Yoke destroyer and burden remover. What did I say the word anointed mean? Yoke Not didn't say yoke break. Somebody said he break the yoke. You break it, you can put it back together. Yoke is anything that burn you down or hold you together to something. Like they did the oxes. They put one ox with another ox and they yoke them up together so he couldn't get away and the other one couldn't. But that's not, that's why he, so he don't say break the yoke. Destroys it. Destroys me to annihilate. So when the anointing destroys the yoke. And it do what? Burden remover. It removed the burden. So whatever's weighing you down, the anointing destroys it and removes it. 
That's why we can say we've been redeemed. Because the burden of sin is not on us anymore. And the yoke that held us together with the devil is not there. He destroyed it. He destroyed it. He is the anointed one. And what the church needs is to get the anointing. And when they get the anointing, they're going to find that burdens will be removed. And they're going to find that yokes have been destroyed. Things that held you back. Things that held you connected to stuff that you didn't want to be connected to. The drugs that man said, I can't get free from. I just left the re-entry program before I came here. And, 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 and they were just, they, they just, they were just so eager to learn. They just need somebody to give them a, 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 a talk as they can make it. You got to let folks know they can make it. With Jesus, we can make it. We're better with Jesus than we are alone. You can't make it on your own, but you with Jesus, you can make it. And so they need that yoke destroyed. They need it destroyed and they need that burden lifted. And, and, and that 45 minutes I spend with them, that's what I, I, I instill in them, that they can make it. And they have hope. They have hope. And they have desire. I went there last week, and, and, and I missed the week before, and my, somebody had told one of the guys I died, and he was crying when I walked in the door. <laughs> see, I didn't think I was going to see you anymore. I don't know, was he hallucinating or what? First number 10. And thou, Lord, in the beginning have laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hand. They shall perish, but thou shalt remainest. They all shall wax old, as doeth a garment. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but thou word shall remain. So do you understand in heaven, we will be governed by the same words. There won't be new words. Not one jot, dot, a tittle of God's word is going to pass away. What is the dot, the little mark you put over the I? What is the tittle, the little cross on the T? Not that much of God's word is going to pass away. It's going to remain the same. It's going to remain the same. Verse 12. And as a vesture. Now notice what he said here. As a vesture. Uh, as a cloak. As a cloak. Shall thou fold them up. And they shall be changed. But thou art the same. And they, thou years should not fail. That means as the world grow older and be destroyed, Jesus will never change. Jesus will never change. Now let me let you in on a revelation that the Lord spoke to my heart about. And that's why we have to sort of be careful. And something that humanly you can't understand. Because when they said the baby Jesus He was a baby and yet a man. Okay, y'all don't understand on this side. Let me go over here. The baby Jesus, he was a baby in flesh, but he was a, for as old as he was ever going to get in God. As a baby, he had birthdays. As God, he never aged. Okay. Amen. Let me go back y'all on this side. Amen. As, <laughs> as a child, he grew in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and in stature. As God, he never grew one inch. As a child, he learned to be obedient. As God, he never had to obey nobody. Okay, let me go back up. Y'all, I'm sort of confusing you all. But see, this is how folks see him, and they would say, the baby Jesus. And, and, and they want to worship the baby Jesus. He was only a baby long enough for them to see him develop as a human and not sin. 
but he never gave up his age and he never grew any older than he was because that was the strangest thing you could see he killed himself to bring himself back alive to let them know that I have the power to take life and to give it back when he killed himself even his flesh didn't really die because it never, rigor mortis never set in. Amen. The blood, he just died so he could let the blood cover us. And once the blood had covered us, he said, it's time for me to get up. I'm, I'm going. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know, when y'all read the Bible, you got to learn to read the Bible and to let God take you by the hand and take you back in the back room and show you how this stuff happened. And don't just read the top. You'll never learn how to make a cake just do, you know, following Betty Cock Crocker's uh, Pillsbury recipe. Because they, all they tell you, add an egg, milk is already in it, add an egg, water, set the oven for 400 degrees or, two, or 375, let it bake for 45 minutes and take it out. All you did was follow instruction. But if you want to know how she did it, then you got to go to the bakery. You got to go to the factory and say, okay, I got to see what better crock to put in there. How much of flavor is she putting in for this cake mix? How, how, how much of baking soda is she putting in? Uh, how much of sugar that they're using? And how many eggs it takes to make this thing? And then you're learning what's in it. You know what's in the ingredient. See, that's why that when the man, when the man Lazarus said to the rich man, said, all I want is the crumb that fall from your table. And that's the somebody, so he wasn't asking for much. Well, he was asking for everything the rich man had because everything that's in the crumb is in the cake. Okay, so, so if you get the cake, you, you get the whole crumb. You get, if you eat the crumb, you eat the cake because everything that's in the crumb is in the cake. Okay, okay, all right. Jay, I'm just losing you. But wait a minute, is that true? Everything is in the cake, is in the crumb. You're just getting a smaller piece, but you're getting the same thing. See, when, when I was coming up, my mom, my mom we, used to, we used to argue about this. Who's going to get a chance to, and I know y'all, some of y'all ain't going to like what I'm saying. Who's going to get a chance to, what I'm, what I'm finna say? You get a chance to lick the, lick the you know, put your hand out, all that, they, 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 they put the cakes in there, and you get a chance to lick the stuff out of there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one? And man, that was good, and it wasn't even done. Now, you was eating it before it was cooked, but it was just as good then as it was going to be when it was cooked. The only thing, it was running then, but when it's cooked, it set still for me. <laughs> God also called him Lord when he said, Lord, in the beginning, you made the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hand. They will disappear into nothing, but you will remain forever. They will become worn out like an old cloth, and someday you will fold them up and replace them. But you yourself will never change, and your years will never end. Somebody said, and that's, that's not the Bible, but... Uh, that's why I like those sermons that some of the Baptist preachers preach. And they said, they asked Jesus, how old are you? And he told them, said, well, what side are you talking about? On my mama's side or my daddy's side? So my daddy's side, I go way back. But on my mama's side, I'm only 12. Said, well, if you go that far back, and that, they got mad at him in the New Testament because they, he said, before Abraham was, I was. Amen. So I'm older than Abraham. Yeah. He said, we know your father, Joseph. You're not even 30 years old yet. He said, that's on my mama's side. Oh, y'all ain't going to talk to me. Let me go on. I got to finish this. <laughs> that's on my mama's side. <laughs> that ain't on my daddy's side. Lord Jesus. But to which... Other angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thee, make thine enemy thy footstool. Which an angel he ever said that to? 
Not a one. And did God ever say to an angel, as he does to his son, sit here beside me? He never said that. Last verse. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? No, for the angels are only spirit messengers sent out to help and care for those who are to receive his salvation. 